So good afternoon, everybody. So we're ready to start this uh, uh, session, which is uh, about something truly innovative, which is for the eyes uh, in tricuspid interventions. We have a, a number of experts in, on the table. We have uh, uh, Stefan van Bardeleben. Uh, you know everybody here. So Nina Wunderich, everybody knows. Sergio Berti, everybody knows. Martin Swans. Yeah. yeah, everybody yeah, yeah. knows. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have learning objectives which, uh, which are very straightforward. We will want to be become familiar with 4D ICE technology. Uh, we want to see whether this can support better some procedures, specifically talking about tricuspid inter interventions. And uh, you are free to be uh, active in this discussion uh, with uh, all kinds of interactions possible. Uh, the in interactions are obviously possible physically. You can stand up, raise your hand, and we can talk. You can use the app. You can do a lot of things. Uh, there are a number of different uh, qu uh, questions uh, which are behind us or in front of us, and we try to answer those. Uh, what are the challenges that we uh, encounter when we treat tricuspid patients? Uh, what is uh, how really this uh, 3D eyes works? Uh, we will see some case presentations and so on. And again, you will have the possibility to be uh, active by polls. So probably we can start with the first poll and see if we, you know how to use this, uh, this technology. So we have a question that you should try to answer. And the question is there. How often, if you do tricuspid interventions, how often you find that the imaging from transesophageal is suboptimal, meaning that it's not enough to be safe and effective in your procedures. Less than 5% of times, between 5 and 10%, or more than 20%. Please vote. I'm waiting for more votes. We have already 65 voting, 73, 92, <laughs> more, more. We need to reach uh, 200, getting more and more. More and more. So, can we show? Uh, we have there. So, only 12 votes. So, some of you probably are not uh, either familiar with the technology or non familiar with the poll. That's good, 13. 13. Anyhow, it looks like that those who are answering, they find it pretty often the case. So, without further delay, I think, Nina, you are the spokesperson, so you should speak next. <laughs> so, a very warm welcome to the session. I just want to remind you that you can rate the session uh, at the app, which is important. So, just to give a short introduction. Um, so, if you look at the imaging modalities we have available nowadays, um, it's clearly that uh, fluoroscopy is a, is a backbone of the procedures. And most of the procedures nowadays are done with 3D to UE uh, for interventional guidance. And uh, in some of the cases where they have some optimal imaging uh, quality, you can think about some alternative imaging modalities like 3D transthoracic echo, which works for some of the procedures. And now we have a new player into the game, and this is for the intracardiac echo. And this is what the topic is today. So I would like to make uh, the introduction of the first presentation, and this will be given by Martin Swans. And Martin, you'll give us an overview about uh, TUE guidance, ICE guidance and some ideas how we could use these technologies. Great, thanks. Yeah, just to set the stage a little bit, what we're going to talk about is the, the 40 eyes, and let's see. So, what we all know, and I think many of you visiting tricuspid session have seen this slide, but it's crucial because why are we having these problems? having uh, visualizing the, tr uh, the t uh, tricuspid valve with TE. So we know the distance from the probe towards the tricuspid valve is the most far furthest distance as we can have. And we know the leaflets are really thin and we know the anatomical variability is large. So in the general metastophical plane also, we are not be able to have a good unfast view of the, of, the, of the valve itself. So we have to go transgastric or deep transgastric or use multiplanar reconstructions to recreate this so it's not that easy to, to, to get. And although we know with more experience we will be able to get better imaging with TE, so it's also an experience wise, but there are definitely situations where imaging can be really tricky. We know 
with in some of the cases the heart can be not so vertical but actually horizontal and the more we have problems with the crux of the heart so fibrous tissue but also septum and especially if we have sh uh, shadowing because of mechanical prosthesis on the right side but also even the device can be in our way when we're doing uh, imaging of the tricuspid valve so challenges enough and if you look at different solutions because some some of these patients simply do not have TE quality sufficient enough to do this we look at the, uh, the, the ice field and I think initially it's been started already in 2000 and it evolved from first generation 40 volume ice in 2012 where we had this very small sector more like a thick 2d slice but now it evolved to completely 40 eyes uh, uh, where we have a high volume rate a big sector where we can nicely visualize the tricuspid file so Looking at the catheter we have from Siemens nowadays, it's the Ekerson Ekernef catheter. So we have 2D, we have 4D, we have 4D flow, and we keep in mind that the volumes go up to 40 when we have 2D imaging and 20 when we have, uh, uh, you are using color. So we have the whole spectrum and it's 12.5 frames. Just to show you a little bit what, what can we achieve with this catheter, I think one of the crucial views we know is the ANFAS view because we have to make sure that we're perpendicular to the line of cooptation. We have to position our device right with color, anything. And we used to used to do, uh, do this transgastric or we use this nice uh, ice imaging. But of course, nowadays for multiple valves or anything, we use the NPR to really align and make sure that everything is anchored or anything. So it little bit depends on what procedure you're doing, but the NPRs, I think, for many of the tricuspid procedures is crucial nowadays. So if we go a little bit into the future, and it's not available yet commercially in Europe, but the Loomis catheter that's coming there, we see that the volumes can go up to 60 nowadays. We have improved multi-planar reconstructions. We have 3D calipers, which m provide you more accurate measurements. And this will come with a complete new system as well, which is AI powered, will give you better analysis, faster analysis. It will recognize anatomy. And I think this is crucial to, to set the stage, but even move further with this field of tricuspid to improve outcomes of our patients. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Martin to introduce the technology, but let's go into the real action. So we have uh, uh, Sergio who is uh, a long-standing user of, uh, of ICE, Kether, for many applications, and specifically, uh, yeah, you can go, and specifically now you gain the uh, experience and expertise in for the ICE. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, Francesco. And thanks for the invitation to this meeting. Um, Martin uh, showed brilliantly uh, how we can we use the uh, ice probe. Uh, for the uh, tricuspid intervention, the uh, best solution uh, today of the ice is this one, the, the, to advance the probe through the inferior vena cava in front of the tricuspid valve. And, uh, the MPR plus the uh, three volume rendering um, live uh, uh, in one shot uh, provides all the information we need. And you can see the red plane uh, show the inflow outflow, the green plane the orthogonal view with the septum and the lateral alignment. You see clearly the leaflets and the blue plane the short axis of the, of the leaflet. In addition, on the right side in the, in the lower part of the screen, you see the 3D volume rendering live. Uh, if we had to the, uh, this image the color, we have a clear definition, the position of the jet or the jets, and so we have all information to uh, plan our edge-to-edge -edge procedure. Uh, the device is advanced under echo guidance. You see in uh, the, uh, the, the 3D volume rendering view the orientation of the, of the device, in this case is a Pascal ACE, and uh, in the blue plane the device, the correct device orientation. At this step we have to check the uh, functionality of the, of the clasp. You do the clasp check in the lateral, that is works fine. The medial that is working fine too. Now we advance the device uh, in a capture position. You see the device in the uh, green plane, the device that is completely opened in a capture position. <laughs> the two uh, leaflets uh, lie on the, on, the, on the device and we can close, capture the, the leaflet and uh, close the device. 
This is the image of the, 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 the capture of the, of the two leaflets. The device is completely closed. We can appreciate the traction on the two leaflets in the lateral septal view. We have the color to this uh, view and we had the uh, preview of the release before the, the, of the, of the results of the, of, the, of the position of the device before the final release. Uh, just a little bit different is the use of the eyes uh, for the direct anuloplasty with cardio band. We know, as we know, the cardio band consists in placing uh, 15, 16 anchors along the board of the tricuspid uh, uh, valve, and then we, we put in traction the system, reducing the distance from the lateral to the settal um, board of the, of the, of the tricuspid. Uh, the first step is an in-phase view of the of the mitral uh, valve uh, with MPR, we can uh, evaluate the, um, circum the, the circumference of the and measure the circumference of the of the annulus uh, for a double check of the the correct device for a correct selection of the device and. Uh, for a correct placing of the anchor, we need a different strategy. The strategy is to use a steroid guiding catheter uh, that keep in place the, the ice catheter. And uh, if we keep in neutral position the, guiding, the ice catheter, we can rotate it and image the anterior and the posterior portion of, or the lateral portion of the, of the annulus, moving the uh, ice probe at the level of the commissure. The quality of the image is excellent. You see the treat of the, of the anchors and the correct position according to the leaflets. And this is a, a, a tag test where we check the stability of the, of the anchor and exactly the same view from with the MPR view. The one of the two plan is aligned with the, mm, with the annulus of the valve and the other with the main axis of the catheter. Uh, more recently, we are changing our strategy. The ice catheter is advancing from jugular approach. The position of the catheter is this one. The visualization is extremely, extremely nice. You see the final result of the cardio band in the right side of the screen. and. Uh, that's meant to change the organization of our cat lab because the, we changed the position of the um, interventional imager that is at the head of the patient, similarly to the position of the TOE. And this is the uh, cat lab set up uh, with the position of the two interventional cardiologists and the, the imager. I think that we have to move toward the new um, professional uh, figure of interventional cardiologist and interventional imager that are very close in terms of uh, professional profile. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio. So I assume that this is a, a new cat lab, correct? You already moved to the new cat lab. It's larger. Y yes. So if you want to do this, you need large cat lab, correct? It's very large. I have to take the car between when I wash, the when I scrub, and the when uh, uh, in the table. <laughs> okay, so we have been already exposed to, to some images, some applications, and uh, again, the floor is open to any question, any technicalities here, any question. I can ask, I can start asking a little bit around, I mean, this is all, you are all experts, but let's start with, uh, with uh, Martin. So, the transition from TOE to ICE. Uh, what are the skills which are necessary for an experienced imager? I think as an imager, of course, uh, we, we know the imaging itself. It's completely, of course, a new way of working around. I think it, 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 as an imager, to work with it, the knobs and these kind of things, that's something new. So that's something you have to get in your hands. But I think in general, if you're an imager and doing TE procedures, you're quite easy to get familiar to use the knobs and get, get the steering down. And, and, and I think... It's, uh, uh, the learning curve is actually quite, uh, quite short. I think, I don't know if, if Nina or, or Stefan had the same experience, but I think that in general, the learning curve for that is quite short because you know the images, you know how to optimize, of course, but, but still getting the right planes, it, 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 you need to have some basic skills and it's good to tra be trained in models or simulators or anything because I think this perfectly fits well with simulators to, to be trained to get the right views. But the best uh, step uh, forward 
uh, um, 4D eyes actually is that it's 4D. I mean, there's a huge difference between 2D and 4D. I, I don't know if the audience uh, is everybody aware of what was the 2D eyes before. It was nice to have, but honestly, it was a bit confusing because you didn't know where, you got good images, but you didn't know where. So now with 4D, you get uh, a large enough uh, uh, picture to orient yourself in all cases, or if you have a wide uh, anatomy, you have problems. Uh, Stefan, what is your experience? You have done how many cases? Well, we, we have done a double-digit number of cases with yeah. uh, different double types Double-digit means uh, 19 or uh, no, 100? Well, uh, no, not 100. <laughs> I would say 30, 30 to 40 Which cases. Uh, but, but I would say that the big difference is you're replacing a funnel or a tunnel view by a pyramid view. So you have a far-sighted, so you can see the whole room with 3D. And if you have 2D eyes, you're just addressing the middle part of this room. I think that's the big difference. So you're moving away from manipulating the cathedral into manipulating on the keyboard. So MPR, different planes become more important. It's a virtual control of the image. It's not so much steering a lot with the catheter. You put the catheter into the region of interest, so you're in the interior part of cardioband, posterior part, etc. But then you can work really with your cut planes. Uh, Nina, there is a question from? Yeah, here comes a question. I mean, it's a very obvious one because, I mean, Martin, you said as an imager, you are operating the ice probe. But it's a question indeed. Who's operating the ice probe? Is it the interventionalist who has it in his hands? Or how, how is it in your side? It depends if you go from jugular, as Sergio sh showed it nicely. I think then it's a little bit off the intervention if you're working from, from the groin, from the leg. Actually, if you're on the leg, um, the interventional can do it actually to place the catheter, rotate it to the region of interest, and then we give the control to the keyboard, actually. And the interventional imager doesn't have to be sterile. He can be go around the room, actually. He can be at the keyboard. You can have ice alone. You can have the combination, depending on what procedure you're doing, actually. I agree. I think at least the images should be at the keyboard doing the yeah. NPR, the reconstructions. But like you said before, now you have the whole view and, and one. So if you once you position your catheter right, it's just NPR reconstructions, optimizing images. And I think that's, that's an imaging part. But you don't have to use that, that many manipulations anymore. So. so just to clarify also for the audience, which is probably not having the you know, the, the privilege of having the hands on this device yet. Huge difference between the 2D eyes that we have been used to have in our mind, where you had to be pretty smart in getting funny configurations of the, of the cater and always struggling a little bit. With this approach, where you park your cater in one position, and after that, you just play the, just like a CT scan, multi planar reconstruction, correct? Sure. That's great. And um, I mean, there is, you know, the, we are in Europe. In United States, uh, for the eyes is becoming almost standard in every procedure. And the main reason is the question that we see there, that you can get rid of uh, general anesthesia, get rid of the imager, and so on. Now, I want to be a bit provocative. So, you know, uh, Nina, uh, enjoy this, uh, uh, this London Vaz. I don't know if, you need, we, if we need you next year. Mm. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm aware no, of that. No, I mean, let me, let me uh, let, so Sergio, imagine tomorrow you have, you know, you don't need the imager. Are you happy? Can you do the, this procedures without an imager? I mean, at the end, you're watching an imager. Everybody can understand the image. Francisco, I think that we have to, to see the question from a different uh, perspective. Uh, I think that we need of uh, an, a dedicated imager for this kind of procedure. The quality of the images, when we decided that uh, the imager uh, manage, when we decided to change from the interventional cardiologist to the imager for the, for the uh, catheter management, changed completely. The quality of the imaging, of the imager, the imaging in general, uh, if it's managed by the imager, is extremely better. Okay, uh, so the um, problem is that we have, to, yes, we, we have to change the mentality of the, of the imager. Uh, they, I think that in the future, as you mentioned before, 
uh, we, we will need of a dedicated professional profile for this kind of procedure, where the imager is not exactly the imager, how is in our mind, but it's a new figure of imager. It's, a, it's a mixed with the interventional cardiologist. A lot of mixed uh, figures in the field, a lot of chaos. <laughs> mixed. Uh, Excellent. Mixed from the professional profile. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> no, I'm saying, okay, fantastic. Uh, I have my personal opinion here. Let me share my opinion. I've been you know, confronted with this question already since many years. Do we need an echo imager on the table in all cases? Answer is yes. And why? Because if you are left alone with your decisions, you take wrong decisions. It's not a matter of a being an imager, being a surgeon, being an interventional cardiologist. I think the solo operations can be done, but not in structural heart, in the AV valves, where there is a lot of uh, thinking, a lot of compromises, a lot of ideas that have to be dealt with in a very... Uh, moving in, in a procedure which is always a moving target is uh, you is it's changing the perspective each step of the procedure so I, for the images in the room don't be afraid so I will invite you next year as well thanks for the interventionalists in the room understand the value of teamwork and collaboration with that I would like to introduce uh, Stefan who is going to show us another perspective of how to use and probably in my opinion the best use of 3d of 4d eyes no it's not 3d it's 4d what is 5d eyes is there any 5d eyes not yet with with sound it's all a new job description so i think we'll move closer together and uh, we'll see that uh, actually the interventional echocardiographer comes to the table comes to the procedure and is more closely embedded. So I think it's a very new perspective and a very nice perspective. So I want to give you another uh, outlook into the 4D ice tricuspic situation. These are my conflicts. So we heard already and we saw with Sergio already the use model that is possible since uh, several years with the AccuVolume system and with the SC2000. And you see a typical case here. We've seen a Pascal case. This is a triclip case uh, where we can nicely see that we have no interaction in the scanning field to the leaflets laying down on the tier device. And of course, you can go further. You can do a cardio band or like I would depict it here in this case. This is an Evoque valve case uh, also done with a 4D ice experience expansion of nine anchors simultaneously and what you do is you don't only grasp two different leaflets anterior to septal posterior to septal but you engage all leaflets of the tricuspid valve at once and you see this in the second image here you can nicely see that the system is flipped it's expanding here already on the ventricular side and if we then go one further you can see a nice functioning valve that is fully expanded with also its atrial side and this device is since two weeks a CE mark and can be used as an additional component to tear therapy. But what I want to show you now is something that is not yet CE marked. So this was a special regulatory allowance to our center. It's an Akunev Lumos um, intervention with a tricuspic TTVR. And this was a compassionate use case by the device. And we simply added the imaging also as a compassionate use allowance prior uh, to CE mark of the device. So I will present you here a 74-year-old female that presented with a severe torrential tricuspic regurgitation. He was New York Heart Association Class 3, had typical peripheral edema and slightly elevated creatinine, gamma GT and BNP. Not extremely high, but you'll see it's a traumatic case. And she had the previous typical history with a pacemaker. And we nowadays know that approximately 25 to 38 percent of our patients with severe or even torrential TR have pacemaker leads that may interact. She had a triple uh, disease, coronary artery disease. She was implanted with a TAVR uh, three years ago, had peripheral artery disease, a trike score of 11%, and she had had chemotherapy and radiation with breast cancer. So something the surgeons don't really like, and ho I, hope, uh, to my, uh, I hope, Francesco, that we're uh, there in the same direction. So the patient underwent a transcatheter tricuspic TDVR. 
And in order to see this, uh, here they are brand new images. So you see the new Lumo system in combination with the Akuson Origin system, which is also a very new console. Uh, you can appreciate that on the left hand side we have a frame rate of 68 frames per second in two dimensional imaging with this four dimensional probe and on the right hand side almost 30 frames per second in color Doppler and you can appreciate I hope that this was not a mild or moderate TR. So would you agree Nina? Is this okay from an interventional perspective? Uh, completely. I mean this is a completely open mitral valve so there is back throughout the entire opening. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, besides that uh, we have an uh, amazing uh, image. Yeah. I mean, I'm impressed by this image. This is also part of the AE situation technology. If you look into the continuity of the pacemaker probe that you see here, even in a two-dimensional depiction, I think it's something we've never seen before. Yeah. And I want to highlight you to look on this also with the three-dimensional images that I will present in the upcoming slides. So I think we have a good temporal resolution. You agree, Francesco? We have a good spatial resolution and we have an excellent color doppler. We see a PISA zone that is distributing from the interior part and this is an inflow outflow view that we see here. We can see the insertion of the pacemaker, we can follow the pacemaker and the system is fast enough that mild rotations really give you the whole picture. But this is two dimensional of course and we now want to move on what do we see if we are three dimensional. So this is MPR and this is still 17 volumes per second. And we see three different cut planes at the same side. On the upper left in the red image, we see an inflow outflow tract of the tricuspid valve to the pulmonary valve. On the green image, we see a four chamber view with the pacemaker. On the blue uh, uh, slide deck or view, we see a short axis view with a color Doppler and this at 16.8 frames per second and then we get a continuous appreciation of the pacemaker cable together with a color image and I think this is even hard to do uh, with a TOE image so I think it shows you how much uh, softer rendering uh, will go into the, the future. And on the right hand side we see this with the leaflets engaged, we see also the pacemaker. So I think this is a very new view. And here we can see the implantation of the device which is a topaz valve. A topaz valve doesn't need to be secured on the leaflets. It's a longer stent. It's a German French development uh, that engages a very soft single stent design together with porcine leaflets. There are only 19 patients treated so far worldwide and this was the first case ever to do this with a pacemaker cable uh, because the company in the beginning was afraid of course that the very soft stent design would have trouble uh, in, in engaging the pacemaker cable and putting it uh, to the annulus. And also here you can see excellent images and we have 78 frames per second on the black and white image. So we're going even beyond uh, what was announced by Martin which was 60 frames per second in real world use of this device. So if we now look into details and again I want to highlight the situation how well you can see the now jailed pacemaker here if you look into the lower right image of the left side uh, and you can nicely see how this pacemaker cable goes to the stent uh, situation. We can follow these situations and we can nicely see that we have none to trace paravalvular leaks on the outside of the stent frame and again we're talking here about 13 to 16 volumes per second with multiple imaging views that can be anatomically corrected and we have nothing in between the scanning device which is located in water in the right atrium and directly looking to the target zone with any, without any air interaction, without any shadowing, without any calcification. So I think it's a very nice outlook of what we are appreciating in the near future. And to give you a comparison, I just put you up the three main as actually Nina did it in the beginning with the workhorses and the additional imaging techniques. You can see a photon counting CT which is brand new in MPR which has a lower temporal resolution. It has a very high spatial resolution of course but it doesn't give you any hemodynamic assessment and it's not a real-time hybrid OR availability. So you can do this to plan your device procedure but then you will have to move to the right side, to the middle and right side. 
And of course we have the workhorse, as already mentioned, which is 4D TOE, which has both high temporal and spatial resolutions. There are more acoustic windows impairments, so we may have a tower procedure, and we have may extend. Uh, it has real-time color Doppler flow, but sedation in most instances is required. And on the right-hand side, you can see that we're moving into a similar, not yet identical, but similar image quality, a very high resolution color Doppler flow, and no sedation in the future required, what has already been alluded by Francesco. And I think this is a bright view into the future, and I thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Stefan. Uh, you've been uh, really comprehensive, a bit too long, eh? you, because you, you spent uh, 10 minutes, but there are no words to, you know, so beautiful, there is no discussion. So we go forward and we talk uh, with Nina, uh, because no discussion, because it has been too long, otherwise we don't have discussion at the end. I think, you know, amazing, amazing images, no discussion. We will, I want to see the future perspectives and then have a final final because we only have 15 minutes left so let's concentrate our lectures keep your questions in your mind be ready for asking questions these are people who are really have a great experience and this is one of the possible futures if not the future of tricuspid intervention so ask questions now is important. And this is more, so my presentation actually is more discussion with you, Francesca, so we'll have a couple of minutes for that. And there's an important question for you, um, uh, Stefan, um, coming from the chat. So is there any situation that you can consider where you have an interaction between the ice catheter and the delivery system you're using? Is there an interaction shadowing from the delivery system? Yeah, we had this case. Actually, we had uh, two cases that we planned with the new LUMO system. And in one case, we had several venal closures, actually. So congenital heart disease, an Atsigos venous system, a closure at the hepatic, uh, um, at the hepatic side from the inferior caval vein, uh, closure of the right jugular vein in one patient made it impossible. We just had one excess route that we needed for the device itself. So uh, strictures. Um, uh, stenosis in the venous system can be a problem with the device, of course. It's very rare. I only see this uh, perhaps in two in a thousand cases, but it is possible, and this would be uh, some, some situation where you have to have a workaround and where perhaps the, the TOE becomes more important. But on the other hand, you may have esophageal varicosis, etc., where uh, the TOE is not working, or you may have a stricture in your esophagus, and then suddenly the ice catheter is the way to go. But the question was about interaction with devices. And interaction that is something in, that happens sometimes. in terms of imaging quality. Yeah. So if you look at the valve and you want to get information out of your uh, image, is there an interaction? Sergio, do you have some uh, insights yes, for uh, us? Really, it's possible to have a minimum of interaction, especially if you advance the catheter from the, from the femoral. Uh, in general, is uh, um, if you move laterally the, with the flex, the catheter and you acquire the volume, the volumetric um, acquisition uh, from a different perspective, you can avoid the interaction or the shadow of the catheter. But, but in for general, sure, for sure, eye scatter is the best way to avoid shadowing. I mean, yeah. yes, but, we, have but to, we have to convey a message here. So when we have, we use eyes because to avoid shadowing. No, it's, and it's, it's, obviously you can have some interaction, physical interaction, because we are playing with two cathers in the same position, and sometimes you move one cather, you reposition the eyes. Yes, but the, the, the interaction between the TOE, the shadow due for TOE, is in general due to the mitral valve, the calcification of the level of the mitral valve. For the eyes, the situation is different. It's possible interaction between the two catheters. So is, you, you have to, to select the correct position of the sky catheter, and you can uh, decide the position, then you lock the device, and uh, you acquire the volume, and you electronically select the, uh, the correct view into the. This is exactly. the so real advantage. Avoid, the, the message is this. that you park in a, an adequate position, and then you work, but without moving the probe. 
Yeah, I would agree. We, we always place the ice probe first, which is a smaller probe. If we come from the uh, inferior cable vein and then we um, put up the sheaf of the intervention site, um, actually you can park your system inferior, uh, posterior and also anterior to your uh, deployment system. So you can avoid this on purpose and yes. you can park this. Typically when you come from the inferior cable, you anteflex a little bit. If you come from jugular, you have to retroflex a little exactly. bit. Yeah, okay. That's good, but this is a bit too complex for those who have never used that. Thank you. <laughs> so, too let's complex talk about for you? No, 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 no. For me, no. <laughs> no. I, nothing is complex. No, but I, I think, you know, we have people listening to us, and they, I don't know if they understand what we're talking about. What I think, to summarize what you are talking about is, you know, it's a different methodology. There, is, there are now two cases that might interact together, but on the other hand, you can yeah. park this, the, the, the imaging cadre in a position which allow you no interaction as well as reduce the shadowing. Good. Nina. So thanks, Francesca. So let's have a look at uh, the potential yeah. advantages we may have with intracardiac echo. So you already mentioned it may limit the, the need for intubation and even the need for sedation, at least in some of the cases. I'm not sure if somebody wants to uh, do a tricuspid intervention with just uh, sedation, but uh, there might be some uh, interventions where you could think about getting rid of uh, um, even sedation. Nina, can I ask you a question? Now, let's do one by one. You have done it, correct? I think it, when you were in, in, uh, in without, Frankfurt, you mean without, uh, a lot of without mitral clip without uh, sedation. How, how the patient behaves? These are procedures where the patient has to be stable, not to move. No, it's really a difficult situation yeah. because at these days, uh, a mitral intervention, even with that stretch, I mean, even if you just think the procedure would take you one hour. You have to take care of the sedation protocol for over an hour for the patient. But on so the other hand, if, if you do try replacement, maybe possible. That's maybe possible. Huh? What do you think? I, I think with additional imaging methods, it will become possible. Uh, we haven't done it yet, so, so you always start from a very secure and very conventional position. But I think uh, we, we have also done perhaps 3% of our mitral and tricuspic interventions conscious, actually. If there was no anesthesiologist showing up, we, uh, we also did this with no or minimalistic sedation. And it's also possible. It's not my preferred method to do this, to, to make this clear, uh, but it's, it, it's a possible scenario for the future. Yeah, I think it's uh, the time of the procedure which maybe dictates what you need, uh, um, a sedation or intubation protocol. So the next uh, a potential advantage could be that we use some operation room time because you don't need uh, sedation for the TE probe and some stuff like that. And we also have a potential, well, this is well in advance in the future, that you may discharge your patient even at the same day. And this has to be proven, but we may also think about that we have uh, something in our hands where we can improve the patient's outcome. So to look into some uh, future perspectives, we already touched a couple of points. So for example, Martin, uh, so the learning curve. So you said um, this is quite easy to obtain. So how many procedures do you need to really get familiar with uh, this new technique? I think, uh, that, uh, as Stefan already nicely pointed out, the 4D gives you so much overview. So that this is a view you already knew from your 3D TEE. So if you used to do 3D TEE for this kind of procedure, I think you can easily adapt. It's more getting used to the knobs than, the, than getting used to the views. It's more like, like we said, we use the NPRs, we rotate it in the same orientation, and you're g good to go. So what we'll also face, we'll have a, a lot of new devices in the future. So do you think, uh, fr um, Stefan, that this will broaden the spectrum and uh, the possibilities of introduction of ice? in new kinds of procedures? Uh, I think every procedure, every device has specific requirements. We've seen this nicely with CardioBand, which is different to a tier procedure. Um, I, I, I think we're very nicely able to, to see precisely leaflets in. We can go from anchor to anchor in combined devices like the VOC valve, and we can also go into new devices where we simply have to show where the coronary um, uh, location is and where we implant uh, as a landing zone. So I think it's, uh, it's a valuable new addition to our toolbox in imaging. So Francesco, you mentioned uh, in the United States uh, it's widespread. 
yeah, widespread use. So why is it not the case in Europe? And uh, what do you think about the cost effectiveness and uh, reimbursement for the ice probe? Well, you mentioned uh, the reason for uh, having a, a, a wider use is because, first of all, because the United States is richer than Europe. First of all, very simple. They have they, they more money. Number two, because there is a strict uh, uh, control on, uh, on, uh, on uh, billing and avoiding the uh, general anesthesia is something that uh, obviously has a big value. Third, there is a specific reimbursement protocol for this procedure, which is missing here. Now, that whether this should be a way to go in Europe or not, I don't, I don't think we should copy uh, the US uh, model. I think the driver for the success of this, of this technology is going to be the, uh, the clinical value. And again, I think there are some areas where I can easily foresee immediately an application. And I think uh, we will see more and more uh, tricuspid valve replacement in the future. We've been uh, repairing many valves which are beyond limits. And now we have the first uh, CMARC device available. More will come. Replacement, I think, uh, can be done probably without anesthesia because it's a pretty fast and less, <clears throat> less uh, precision uh, dependent uh, procedure. So I think in that case, probably we will see this technology enter. Uh, whether this will be used in every tricuspid procedure, questionable because of cost, because of sustainability. But I think, for instance, a, a cardio band, the, the typical example, cardio band is one of those procedures which are done only in few centers. The main reason was imaging and control. And actually, I've been always an advocate of doing eyes only cardio band because you get fantastic uh, images. And now you have, with 4D, you really don't need TE anymore. So there are many applications where I see clinical value and probably increase safety. Like, for instance, I think in cardio band you have increased safety because you have less shadowing, more precise imaging. So again, we need to build experience. Uh, you have done 30 something. How many have done uh, uh, for the eyes, uh, Sergio? So, uh, for the eyes, I think uh, 15. I don't know. How many you, Martin? Learning curve in the beginning, you're still. Yeah. Three, four, yeah, yeah. five. So again, this is the, this is the experienced team, imagine how long is the, you know, how much has to be done yet, but even now, at the very beginning, you can already see that it, that's, it's applicable. So I, I was really shocked by the quality, to be honest. Yeah, but we have a new imaging tool. Yeah, and I think uh, as we learn it with TE, so we need uh, some protocol standardization to really s to do to learn step by step how to apply this technology. So, Sergio, you are involved in this expert consensus paper. So, what are the needs? What do we need to put in there? Uh, thanks, Ina. Uh, Francesco touched a very very important point. We have to work f to for the standardization of the procedure. We have defined clearly for each kind of procedure uh, what is the best uh, probe positioning, what is the best modality of acquisition, and so on. Uh, the, the aim of the consortium is the diffusion of the 4D eyes, uh, collecting the experience of the, of the, of the main expert in the field just to define the current status of the art. And then, we, 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 after we have to start uh, defining better the, for a single procedure, a defined standardization of the, for the valve. Uh, Stefan mentioned before that each one different uh, procedure requires a different approach. Uh, absolutely agree. And we have to define for each one a, a, a precise description of how to use, and we have to work to simplify the procedure, as Francesco mentioned. If we are not able to simplify the procedure, it's extremely, extremely difficult to, to diffuse this kind of approach. So how long, you, do we ha how long do we have to wait for the paper? Just yes. one question. Paper. Ah. Yeah. And next year. Yeah. Oh, OK. <laughs> we need some more. It's November. So there is one question from a very active online 
participant. I have seen him asking questions in all the me uh, sessions I've been. The question is a bit difficult to be answered, <laughs> but it's a good question. Would anyone dare to give an opinion as to which vendor has the best images? Yeah. I don't give the answer. Listen, it's a, wait a second. It's a good question because it tells us there is a value in this imaging modality. I don't know who has the best image. I think every vendor is improving. Uh, every, every week we see new stuff coming on. And I don't know what is the answer, uh, dear Giuseppe. Uh, thank you for the question, but this underlines once more that we are going in the, in the right direction because we have new technology, which is, uh, is an enabling technology. There is a lot of effort uh, from uh, physicians and industry to define the best practices. And uh, with this, I thank you for your attention. Thank you for uh, your questions. And uh, good uh, the rest of the day. Don't uh, miss the 20 years tier celebration is going to be fun. <laughs> Thank you.